Good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to PTPOG, Practicing the Presence of God. Pastor Michael Hayes back with you on this incredible Sunday morning. And God is good. I'm so glad you're here with us. Good morning. Good morning, Rhonda. How are you? I trust that things are going well and that you have or are having, I may should say, a wonderful weekend. It is the second half of the weekend. <laughs> and we know we love our weekends here at PTPOG. Good morning, Smitta. How are you? Good morning. How are you? So listen, today is an incredible day because today I'm using our camera for the first time. So I'm praying that this looks better to you, that the image is a little bit sharper, a little bit crisper, and uh, that things are, are, are looking a lot better than they are. If they, if they are looking better, let me know. If they aren't looking better, let me know. Uh, give me some feedback so I can uh, adjust things as needed. But uh, the point is, the camera that you guys were able to uh, help me purchase is in use right now. I was able to put it together uh, for today. So I hope that, uh, it's, it's looking better. Uh, I hope that it's in balance and everything is, is better. I got to get some lighting, some better lighting going on and some other things that I need to put together. But I thank God so much for you and those of you who, uh, donated and gave to me. Uh, so it's just such a blessing. I really, really appreciate you so much. And uh, I feel so much better to be able to be uh, on uh, live every single morning. With that, we're moving forward in our messages today. <clears throat> oh, it is clear, Smith. Okay, good, good, good. I'm glad, glad. <laughs> I know the camera is really clear. That's one thing about it. It's really clear. So, you, you know, you got to be careful because this camera picks up, up just about everything. So anyway, uh, we're looking at Proverbs 21 and verse number 12. Talk Proverbs 21, and we're looking at verse number 12. We're going to see what God has for us today. In Proverbs 21 and verse 12, it says, The righteous man wisely considereth the house of the wicked, but God overthrows the wicked for their wickedness. I'm going to say that one more time. The righteous man wisely considers the house of the wicked, but oh, but God overthrows the wicked uh, for their wickedness. Today, today, we're looking and speaking from the subject. Hey, Sherry. Oh, good, good, good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you like that shirt? Yeah, I need the body to put in this shirt. <laughs> I I'm going to get slim one day. I'm going to get slim one day. Thank you, Sherry. So we're looking today at don't let patience fool you. Don't let the patience fool you. Let's bow our heads and seek the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for your kindness towards us. We ask, Father, that you would bless us and help us. Uh, just, uh, Lord, infuse your wisdom this morning to us. We need it. We need it desperately. That's why we're here, because we need for you to speak a word into our lives. So, Lord, speak to us today, and please give us this day our daily bread. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, good morning, Elder Jackson. Good morning, good morning. <clears throat> Let the righteous man wisely consider the house of the wicked, but... God overthrows the wicked for their wickedness. Don't let patience, don't let the patience fool you. Let me ask you a question. Can we see the future? Can you see the future? Well, honestly, we can because wisdom gives us the ability to see the future. The ability to see the future means that in the present time right now, I can look at things right now 
and see that things are not necessarily going to be the same as they are or as they all seemingly always have been. That's what looking into the future is, peering into the future is, seeing the future. That's what it is. And wisdom allows us and affords us that wonderful benefit. You should see that many of those who are popular and prosperous right now will soon be not so popular and not so prosperous. In fact, many will be destroyed. God does bring judgment. He might not bring it immediately as we would oftentimes like him to, but, da, but God, excuse me, does bring judgment. And he will judge those openly who proudly live lives that are wicked and in error. Wisdom includes the discernment. Wisdom gives us the discernment and the understanding to see that God's reckoning, though it might not happen exactly at the time we think it might or should, it does happen. And when it does happen, it happens very, very quickly. You see, ladies and gentlemen, many of us especially those of us who are in the church, those of us who are trying to live righteous lives, those of us who are trying to seek the will of God in our lives. A lot of times we take a look around and we see what's going on and we ponder, we consider, if you will, as the proverb says, the house of the wicked. We look at people who obviously can't stand God completely denounce God with it, not only with their lives, but with their mouths, with their speech. We see the evil and wickedness that is portrayed right before our very eyes on oftentimes on camera, on the news, and people even be seen to be come more popular as a result of it. And we say to ourselves, well, what, you know, in some sense, and I know we shouldn't, but oftentimes we do. Well, what good is it to live righteously right now when they're the ones that are receiving all the benefits for doing what they're doing. But we need to understand, we need to understand that there is a future that is quickly approaching. There is a future that is coming and that future is going to be brought by God. And when that future comes, God is going to separate the goats from the sheep, as it were. God is going to make a differentiation between those who are righteous and those who are not righteous. And so the first point on this subject I want to make is this. The wise know, the wise know that sin will ultimately destroy those who embrace it. The wise know that sin will ultimately destroy those who embrace it. Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23, Moses wrote this in Numbers 32 and verse number 23. He said, but if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord and be sure, be sure your sin will find you out. Now, of course, we know about this story, the story of Achan who had stolen from uh, the people by taking some extra uh, gold and silver and some other things that he hid in his tent when God told them not to take anything. Uh, he took some things for himself and he thought that, well, nobody knows, nobody's gonna find out, it's not gonna matter. But God had brought somewhat of a curse on the land of the entire group of people because there was sin, quote unquote, in the camp. You see, ladies and gentlemen, many people think that when I do things that are outside the will of God or when I do things that are outside the ways of righteousness, that it really doesn't impose itself on anybody else but myself. It's just my sin. But honestly, the fact that we sin and we seem or appear to connect ourselves with a group of people who claim to be a people of faith, we can actually bring a curse on the house of God because your sin has to be found out before things be, can be clear, before God can actually bless his own house. Lord have mercy. 
be sure, Moses said, your sin will find you out. And many of us have found this out in our own lives. I know I've found it out in my own life. There's been many a time when I thought that I was doing something that nobody else would ever find out, that nobody else would ever see, that nobody, and so I just continued to keep doing it. I, I didn't fight it, just continued to keep on doing it and became bold and proud in what I was doing, which is what sin does. Sin has a tendency to make you proud of it when you're not cut off from it immediately, when you're not judged for it. That's the problem oftentimes. And so I began to get in more emboldened and lo and behold, eventually, just like that, it was found out. It was found out. And I know you have had similar experiences, either when you were young or even as you're older now. The truth of the matter is be sure the idea that, well, I can sin with impunity and nobody's ever going to find out. It's never going to bother anybody. That is not true. That is not true. And that's what we need to learn from this particular proverb today. Notice with me, Job chapter 20, verses four through seven. Job chapter 20. This is the book of Job. Incredible book. I believe it's another book written by Moses himself on the story of Job. Moses is the author more than likely. And notice what the book of Job says here in Job chapter 20, verses four through seven. Knowest thou not this of old, since man was placed upon the earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment. Though his excellency mount up to the heavens and his head reach unto the clouds, yet he shall perish for his forever like his own dung. They which have seen him shall say, where is he? Mercy. What is that text telling us? That text is telling us that when we involve ourselves in wickedness, in debauchery, in foolishness, and evil, that, ladies and gentlemen, our lives don't last long. Our life involving ourselves in such practices, triumphing over others by declaring, hey, I'm wicked and I can do whatever I want to do and I don't care what anybody says, it won't last long. It is but for a short time, Job says. He says the joy of the hypocrite, the hypocrite, the one who knows to do right and pretends like he is doing right, but is doing wrong and is feeling joyful and victorious about it, emboldened in it, says, Listen, your joy is only going to be for a moment. Mercy. Mercy. Be sure your sin will find you out. You and I need to know that, that as wise people, sin ultimately will destroy those who embrace it. Point number two is this on this subject. The wise know that the sinner's life of pleasure is temporary at best. Once again, we see this in Psalm 73, Psalm division 73, verses three through six. The Bible says, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Notice what David is saying. He said, I was envious. I was kind of jealous of the wicked when I saw how prosperous they were. And how many know that wicked people on this planet, unfortunately, are oftentimes very prosperous because of the corruption that we find on our planet. You can be evil, wicked, you can do wicked things and practically get away with it. In fact, you might even get a pat on the back for it. I was watching the news the other day where a young man, 17 year old young man, took a, an assault rifle and went to one of these protests at night and wound up killing two people. After he killed two people, he walked towards the police. Did you hear what I just said? After murdering two people with a gun, by the way, that was illegal for him to have. And by the way, he was, <laughs> he was completely outside of his own state. He came from Illinois to Wisconsin to shoot some people. He murdered two people 
and he ran to the police for protection from the crowd. That is the height of corruption. When the wicked can find solace and safety in the arms of those who are sworn to uphold law and justice, that is the height of corruption. And that is what we are seeing today. We're seeing the folly of individuals being rewarded right in front of our very eyes. And oftentimes as, as Christians and as those who are seeking to do what's right, who are trying to sacrifice, doing what we wanna do for the sake of God and for his purpose on this planet and for the sake of saving others, we oftentimes have a tendency like the psalmist here, become envious of those who can do whatever they jolly well please and yet they continue to be prosperous. He says in verse four, for there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. He says the sickness doesn't even seem to come upon them. They seem to have great health and strength. Isn't that something? And the people of God sometimes seem like they're always in the hospital. Have you ever felt like that? Verse six, therefore pride compasses them or pride circles them like a chain and violence covers them like a garment. In other words, he's saying that their violence actually uh, uh, acts as like a soft blanket to cover them and keep them warm. He said, I was jealous. I was, I was uh, 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 envious of these foolish people because they have, and I don't have, and I've been trying to do what's right, and they could care less about doing what's right or doing anybody right or doing or treating people right. Oh, but read the rest of the chapter. Notice with me, God rewards the deeds of the unrepentant wicked. Notice with me, verse 16, verses 16 through 19. Notice with me, same psalm, same psalmist. Watch this. He said, when I thought to know about this, he said, it was too painful for me at first until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood, I, I understood their end. He said, surely thou did set them in slippery places you cast them down to destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. Ladies and gentlemen, when the wicked have judgment cast upon them, it happens so fast. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that? It happens so quickly. It's almost like they don't even have time to turn their head to figure out where they are. When the wicked are judged, it happens just like that. They fall immediately. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that when you're involving yourself in wicked acts, in foolish acts, that, that when judgment comes in your life, that it happens right quickly? Immediately. When it comes, it comes and it comes hard. That's the point I'm making. God is trying to tell us through the pen of the psalmist, listen, don't, don't overly consider the house of the wicked to such to the point that you think or feel jealous of them. We should never be jealous of the wicked. Come on, say amen. We should never be envious of what the wicked are capable or able to do or what they are experiencing right now because right now is their only reward. There's a new life coming. There's a everlasting life coming. And unfortunately, if they continue in their ways, they won't have any part in it. We should feel sad for them. We should feel brokenhearted for them. We should pray for the wicked and ask God to reach into their heart and seek to change their lives as well as changing our hearts and minds. 
Notice with me, point number three. The wise know that there is a difference between the righteous and the wicked. The wise know that there is a difference between the righteous and the wicked. According to Solomon, Solomon, wisest man ever to live besides Jesus, told us very, very clearly in Proverbs chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. Here's what he says. He says, evil pursues sinners. Did you hear that? He said, evil pursues after sinners, but to the righteous, good shall be repaid. In other words, evil chases down those who are sinning as a form of payment for their hard work and hard labor in doing evil and wrong. Isn't that something? When you sin, when we and I involve ourselves in sinful and wicked actions, we actually get paid for our actions. We actually get a paycheck. And you know what that paycheck is? Death. For the wages of sin are death and destruction over the gift of God. It is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Notice, the gift of God, not the paid wages of God, but the gift of God, not the paycheck of God. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. So we don't earn salvation. It's gifted to us by the grace and goodness of God. But ladies and gentlemen, you work hard and you go into the labor camp for sin only to receive a reward of eternal death. I don't want that reward. Come on, say amen. You can keep that devil. Come on, say amen. He said a good man, verse 22 of Proverbs 13, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of the sinner, though, is laid up for the just. Isn't that something? God says, God says that don't be don't be concerned about all these uh you know wayward and and corrupt people gathering all this money to themselves. God says they're gathering it up for those of you who are following after my righteousness. He said they're laying up their treasure for the just. That's what God says. That's why we don't have to be upset and, and scared and concerned about the fact that the ultra rich are making their coffers bigger and larger and richer as a result of this COVID-19 situation. We all know what's going on. We can see it. We're not blind. The ultra rich are making things richer for themselves while stealing and robbing from those who work hard every single day. Doesn't matter. God says they're gathering their riches up to gather up to give to my righteous ones. <sighs> Mercy. That's some rough stuff. Come on, say amen. But not for us. Not for us. Let them gather. Let them collect. Let them reserve and hold on to and save and save and save up. Because they're only doing it for us. Those of us who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. Come on, say amen. Notice with me, Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 18 through 21. Here's what the Bible says. The wicked work in a deceitful work, but to him that sows righteousness, so he that pursueth evil pursues it to his own death. Mercy. They that are of a forward heart or the, the, the people who are boisterous in their sin, who are loud with their corruption. That's a forward heart. They are an abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. And though hand joined in hand, the wicked shall not go unpunished, but the seed of the righteous, they shall be delivered. Somebody say amen. Ladies and gentlemen, you may see people garnered together, hold hands together in order to do evil against other people. You may see the corrupt gather their hands together with the corrupt, join hands in corrupting the entire world that they are a part of. But I want you to know God says they will be punished if they continue in their way. But the seed of the righteous, 
your children and my children, they will be delivered. That's a promise from God. There's a difference between the righteous and the unrighteous, between those who seek the Lord and those who reject his advances in their life. There's a differentiation. There's a difference between those two people. Proverbs 28 and verse 18 says it this way. Whoever walks uprightly will be saved, but he that is perverse in all his ways shall fall at once, shall fall precipitously, shall fall very quickly. You see, ladies and gentlemen, those who are perverse in their ways, those who walk in the wickedness and corruption and evil of this world and embrace it, oh, it looks like they're having a good time right now. They're having a party all day and all night. Oh, it looks like they're just living high off of their wicked hog right now. But ladies and gentlemen, when destruction comes, it comes hard, it comes fast, it comes quickly. Lord have mercy. May the Lord have mercy on all of us. This is my last point of the day, and then I'm going to let you go. Point number four, the wise know that God's patience is meant to bring repentance. Don't be fooled by God's patience. What are you saying, Pastor? Don't be fooled by the patience that you see exhibited in God. God takes his time bringing justice on the wicked. We all know that. People do evil and they get away with it. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. People are corrupt and they continue to corrupt. And God is patient. He does not bring immediate justice. But that doesn't mean that he never will. And that doesn't mean that God is somehow different in character, that God somehow loves the corrupt and the corruption out here, that God is embracing the wickedness out here. No, that is not true. What God is doing is he's being merciful because he does, his desire is for the wicked to turn around, to change. His desire is for the wicked to come to a knowledge of him so that they can make a conscientious choice to follow his way, his will, his purpose. Don't take God's patience for granted. Don't think that God's patience is here to make it look or appear or seem like he wants wickedness to continue to thrive. That is not true. That is not true. God is patient for a reason so that we can learn to change and turn around. It says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but in fact, he's patient towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that we all should come to repentance. The reason why God is so patient, the reason why God is so long-suffering and kind towards us and does not bring immediate justice on us when we do wrong is because he desires for our heart to repent. He wants us to turn around. He hopefully wants us to see his love and justice and patience and kindness towards us and his grace that he gives us on a daily basis as we see new mercies every morning, as Jeremiah says. Hopefully we will wake up and see that God is good and we need to stop involving ourselves in these wicked and terrible corrupt actions that we're doing. That is God's purpose in being patient with us, to get us to turn around. Notice verse 10 though, notice verse 10, but the day of the Lord, mm, he said, I wish that all of you come to repentance. That's why I'm being patient with you. He says, but I want you to understand something. Watch verse 10. Watch verse 10. This is the character of God. Watch verse 10. He said, but don't misinterpret. Don't, 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 don't be fooled by my patience. Because the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. 
in the which the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works therein shall all be burned up and you and I are gonna be burned up with it if we cling to the wickedness of this world. God says, you've gotta wake up. Don't be fooled by my patience. Don't be fooled, but instead repent. Because when the day of the Lord arrives, it's going to come like a thief in the night. How does a thief come? He may, That's a simile there. That's a simile. Like or as is a simile in grammatical uh, study. So God says, I'm coming like or as a thief in the night. How does that's a, that, that poses a question. How does a thief come in the night? Does a thief come telling you, hey, 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 I'm a thief. I'm, a, I'm about to rob your house. Does a thief do that? Does a thief tell you immediately when he's coming? No. And neither is God. When the day of the Lord comes, most won't even know he's coming. Most won't even recognize it. Like a thief, he's going to show up out of nowhere. It's going to come, and it's going to come quickly, especially against those who don't know him. That's what God is saying. Don't be fooled by my patience. The righteous understand. The righteous understand God's plan of patience and they become patient themselves like their God. The righteous understand God's patience, God's plan of patience. They understand his plan because they know that the Lord is merciful. The reason why God is patient is because, listen, God has been patient with me. That's why I understand why he's being patient with all these other crazy people out here doing all this crazy stuff because he's been patient with my crazy self. Somebody say amen. God could have wiped me out a long time ago, but he hasn't, and he did not. And I thank you for it. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for being patient with me. So therefore, I don't want or desire for God to be impatient with others. Why? Because he's been kind and long-suffering with me. So I'm going to learn to be patient with him. I'm going to allow God to do his perfect work. I'm going to allow patience to have its perfect work, as it says in James chapter 1. Let patience have her perfect work. In other words, let God's mercy do its operative work on the hearts of men, the hardened hearts of men and women. I'm patient because God is patient. I'm kind because God is kind. I'm merciful because God is merciful. I'm forgiving because God has forgiven me. I take on the character of my father, which is in heaven. Notice with me Psalm 37, Psalm division 37. This is our last text for the day. Psalm division 37, verses 7 through 11. Here's what the word of God says. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Don't fret yourself because of him who prospers on, in his way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. Don't fret yourself. Don't become frustrated because people are prospering, doing their own wicked things. He says, cease from anger, verse 8. Cease from being angry against them because that's going to make you like them. Don't be angry like them. Forsake your wrath, he says. Don't frustrate yourself in any wise to do evil. Notice, anger is a precept for evil. It's a precursor to doing evil. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to be careful about being angry, about racism and injustice out here. I understand it. I recognize it, I realize it, but you and I don't need to ponder it over and over again and allow that anger to come up in us and turn us into evil and wicked people. 
Are you listening to me? Instead, let patience have her perfect work. Well, when is God going to do what he's supposed to do? That's not your issue. That's not your problem. God is God. You are God's child. You and I must learn to rest in the arms of the patient God, the merciful God, who is trying to save everybody he can, even the racist, even the murderers, even the robbers and the liars and the cheaters. He's trying to save all of them, just like he's trying to seeking to save your scroungy butt. So let God have his patient work in everybody's life. I know you're frustrated. I know you're mad. I'm mad too. We're upset, but don't let that anger turn into wickedness. Don't fret yourselves for those who are prospering in their way, who are bringing wicked devices to pass on the earth. Cease from your anger, forsake wrath, fret not yourself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers will be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, <laughs> they shall inherit the earth. Those who wait patiently with the Lord, they will inherit the earth, God says. For yet in a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yes, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be, verse 11. But the meek, the meek, the meek shall inherit the earth. Not the ones who take up arms and get out here and start fighting against people. No, the meek shall inherit the earth, God says. Not the people who pick up swords and guns and get out here and start shooting at people because I don't like the fact that they don't like me. No, the meek shall inherit the earth because the meek know that God will bring justice and that right quickly. And when he does, I want to be on the right side of justice. Notice, the meek shall inherit the earth and they shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Isn't that a beautiful song? That's a beautiful song. It really puts into perspective what's going on on a daily basis here in America and all around the world today. In the midst of this COVID pandemic that we're in, people are still angry, frustrated, swinging on each other, uh, uh, you know, spitting lies and deceptions on against each other. Uh, uh, speaking words of evil and wickedness and corruption against each other, and even shooting and killing one another, all in the name of racism, sexism, this ism, that ism, politicism, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. They just want to be angry and mad and kill their brother and sister. It doesn't even matter. God says, you are not to be that way. Instead, you're to wait on the Lord and stand firm in my righteousness. Don't involve yourself in this you know, proliferation of violence around here and anger and frustration, but be meek, humble, and wait to see my mighty works take place. Old people are gonna talk about you. Oh, they're gonna declare, oh, he's no, oh, they're just terrible. All oh, these Christians, they never do anything. Oh, this, that, and the other thing. No, I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord. I'm waiting on the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't speak up. That doesn't mean that I don't declare the righteousness of God and I don't let people know when they're doing something wrong. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I'm not going out here and picking up arms in the middle of the night and trying to storm and, 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 and kill and shoot people or star, stir up trouble. I don't have to do that because God has control of this thing. I trust in the Lord and so should you. Come on, say amen. So should you. Yes, there are evildoers. Yes, there are wicked people out here. Yes, yes, it's happening. But that's God's job. That's not mine. That's God's job. What am I doing? I'm praying. What am I doing? I'm uplifting the banner of Jesus Christ. What am I doing? I'm showing people that there's a different way to live. And that is 
meekly bowing down before the mercy of God and allowing his transforming power to change our lives and our hearts. What do you say today? Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Father God, I thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us today that just because you're patient doesn't mean you aren't just. That just because you're patient, it doesn't mean that you have suddenly become a corrupt God. No, your patience is a reflection of your character of love and kindness and mercy and grace towards humanity. You're seeking to get us all to repent and change and turn around. So Lord, please, please reach each and every hardened heart this morning, each and every racist heart this morning, each and every frustrated heart this morning. Reach each and every person out here, Lord, who needs the softening, softening presence of your glorious peace, your love poured into their life. Do this, Lord, because we cannot do it for ourselves. And God, give us the patience that you have, that, Lord, we might wait on you and become the inheritors of the earth as you have promised in your word. Thank you, God, for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Listen, I pray that this has been a blessing to you. If it has, please like it and share it on your Facebook page. And if you haven't already, please join the PTPOG ministry family. Just, just go to your uh, search engine on your Facebook app, click inside of it, and type in PTPOG. It will pull up a purple icon. Click on it and join our family. We would love for you to be a part of this ministry. Listen, if you're watching this by way of Facebook, and I pray that you are, thank God for you. Thank you for staying by with us. Leave a comment down below if you would for me. I would really greatly appreciate it. And we always respond to comments. And also consider becoming a subscriber to our Practicing the Presence of God page. Would love to have you be a part of the ministry. God bless you. God keep you is my prayer. I know that the Lord is with you today. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage. Wait, I say, on the Lord. God bless. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.